Hey everyone, before we begin, I have a short announcement. Into the Verse is going to be taking a break for a little while to give us at Aleph Beta some time to work on some really exciting projects you can look forward to. We plan to come back at some point, so stay tuned. But in the meantime, you can keep up with the Parsha with last year's episodes of Into the Verse, which are available on alephbeta.org, along with our animated Parsha videos. We also just released a new season of A Book Like No Other. That's Rabbi Foreman's newest podcast, which is also on our website. I highly recommend you check that out. But for now, we have one last amazing episode for you coming right up. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Rabbi Foreman. I am back here with Ari Levison. Thank you for welcoming me, Ari, as a guest in your beautiful studio here in central Jerusalem. Great to be with you here live. So Parsha Mishpatim begins with the laws of Hebrew servants. What I thought we'd do is just review the first two sets of laws in Parsha Mishpatim. And then what I want to show you is sort of the Torah's own drash on that. It's as if there's this simple meaning, but then there's this whole overlay of meaning which shades the simple meaning in all sorts of really interesting ways. So let's start with the simple stuff and we'll build off of that. We begin by talking about how servants go free. The first thing you hear about is not the responsibilities of a servant to the master. It is when the servant goes free. This is one of the great innovations of the Torah. When it comes to a Hebrew servant, there's no such thing as perpetual slavery. Seventh year, you're out of there. And then we begin to hear these really interesting laws. We talk about the servant's family, the servant's wife. If he goes in single, he goes out single. If he goes in married, he goes out married. But... What happens if the master gives him a wife during his term of service, another servant girl that the master owns, and they have children? Well, it turns out that in such a case, when it's time for him to leave, but not time for her to leave, so she stays behind along with the children, and he goes out alone, which, as you can tell, creates a certain tension, the possibility for the servant to say, I'm not so sure about this leaving thing, right? Which is the right. next law. What if the servant says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go free. At that point, the master brings him to the judges, he brings him to the doorpost of the master's home, pierces his ear with an awl, and he has to work for him forever. The Tarsh Peh tells us it doesn't mean forever, it means he works for him until Yovel. So that's the first set of laws. The second set of laws has to do with a maidservant, and the laws of female servitude, in fact, have very little to do with servitude. What they are actually is a social engineering experiment, seemingly, as a way of taking poor, destitute girls born to poor, destitute families and giving them a chance at another life. So if you have a guy who's facing financial ruin, no chance he's going to be able to marry off his daughter, no chance that that she is going to have a decent life. So what he can do is indenture her, so to speak, to a family of some nobility, but only when she's very young, so that she can grow up there, quote, as a servant, they can get to know her, and hopefully the master's kid takes a liking to her. And the idea is, it's the chance for her to marry into the family, but if it doesn't work out, that's fine too. So basically the way these laws work is, when a man, quote, sells his little daughter into servitude as a maidservant, she doesn't go out the way male servants go. I think in Pshat, the simplest way to understand that is that in the last set of laws, Ari, think about what marriage was for the servant. If you were a servant and you got married yeah. during your term of servitude, is that good news for you when it comes to your freedom or bad news? No, that, that's the chain that holds you back. Because if you want to keep your wife and family, you have to stay indentured. Exactly. But when it comes to the woman, it's exactly the reverse. For her, marriage isn't an obstacle to going out. It's the vehicle to going out, as we're about to see. There's this intention that during her term of servitude, somebody in the household is going to say, she's fantastic. Just marry her, and then that's the end of servitude. Now, if that doesn't happen, if she's so bad in the eyes of her master, that he doesn't designate her as a, as a wife. So at that point, the father has the chance to 
redeemer and say, hey, this isn't working out. I'm taking her back. The father has that right to redeem her. In any case, it literally means to a Gentile nation, she cannot be sold. But the way the Tarsh Baal understands it is that the master has no ability to sell her to anybody else. Anybody who would sell her would be the equivalent of selling her to a Gentile nation. That's not his right. His right is to decide if he or his children want to marry her. And if right. not, the father can take her back. In Livnoya Dena, if the master's son in the end designates her and marries her, he has to treat her as a completely equal wife. She can't be the little servant girl wife, right? In those days, you can marry more than one one wife. If you ever choose to marry another woman, he can't have the favored wife and the unfavored wife. The clothing that he gives her, the love that he gives her, the, the food that he gives her, none of it can be lessened in light of what he would give to an alternative wife. And if in the end the father can't redeem her and nobody marries her, she also goes free at the end of six years. The experiment failed. That's basically right. the idea. Right. So to recap, we have two sets of laws here. We have the one of the male servant for whom if he were to get married um, as part of his servitude, if he wants to stay with his family, he has to basically stay with his master forever. Um, and then the female servant, which is totally the opposite, um, whose father actually sold her into servitude as a way to help her get out of their socioeconomic rut. You know, there's an opportunity for the master's son to marry her or for the master himself to marry her, in which case he has to treat her just as well as he would um, a wife from any other situation. And we get this law um, that neither he nor the father are able to just sell her either the father to another nation or the Sigma understands this new master can't resell her at any point. Exactly. Okay, so what I wanted to do is share with folks out there a find that I came upon, which I think is really astounding. If you've been around the block with Aleph Beta, you know that one of those general themes that uh, we think are out there is that the stories of the Torah are not entirely separate from the laws of the Torah, and stories can become laws. Laws can have their antecedents and stories. This set of laws, I think, is a great example of that. There are stories back in Genesis that give birth, so to speak, to these laws, or the Torah's laws are a response to a story. Now, when they're a response to a story, that could be a couple things. There could be something worked out really well, so we want to emulate that and say, let's do that. Right. There can be a case where something worked out really badly, and we say, well, that was bad. Let's not do that. And then there could be a hybrid where they're like, we'll take little bits and pieces from this, but we're going to sort of change it around. But one way or the other, you can't really understand the whole texture of the laws, I think, without listening carefully to the text and listening to a story. The laws in the Torah, they're not arbitrary laws that come out of nowhere, but they're really built on our history. Yes, absolutely. So it occurred to me um, that something like that is going on here. And I, I don't remember exactly what the big tip-off was for me, Ari, <laughs> but it may have had to do with these strange words that appear in these laws, that he shall not, the master, uh, go and sell this girl into slavery to a Gentile nation, La'am Nachri, it just kind of felt suggestive to me because there's this story back in Genesis where you have women specifically using this language to talk about what someone did to them. And of course, the story I'm talking about is the story of Lavan, his daughters, and Yaakov. This is actually what the daughters of Lavan, Rachel and Leah, will say to Yaakov, our fathers has treated us like this Gentile. He's treated us as if we were strangers. He's sold us. And it's just a little too coincidental, that language. It felt like an echo. So I started poking around to see if any anything else here reminded me of Yaakov, Lavan, and his daughters. And it turned out that everything did. <laughs> and that's what I want to try to go through with you now. For those of you who can't see Rob by Foreman's computer, it's like an entire text and just everything is highlighted. <laughs> yeah, I can just turn around my computer over here and show you, but, you know, as best you can tell. Um, so basically, here's the theory. I just looked at the beginning of these laws. If you should buy for yourself a Hebrew servant, you should work for six years, but in the seventh year, he should go free. So, Ari, if I would say to you, do we ever have a historical precedent of somebody 
who was a Hebrew, who was a servant, who was working for six years, and in the seventh year, he really should have gone free. Who would that be in the book of Genesis? That would be Yaakov. That's Yaakov, right? Because Yaakov says, look, I'll work for you for seven years, but at the end of my seven years, I want to marry Rachel, your daughter. So what should have happened at the seventh year? Should have been, okay, your term of service is up, and now you get the daughter, right? Didn't work out that well for him, though. Instead, she gets switched under the chuppah, and he says, well, you keep on working. Now, no time off, right? The seventh year, which is supposed to be this year of freedom, just becomes a year of work that becomes an eighth year and a ninth year and a second set of seven years, and it keeps on going, and Yaakov just keeps on working and working for Lavan. So it's almost as if there's a commentary on the Yaakov story, which is that something didn't go right here. And this is a sort of travesty or a corruption of the way things should be. Ari, if we go back to the Lavan story, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what happens at the very end of the Lavan story. Yeah, so Yaakov escapes in the middle of the night. Lavan is quite upset about this. He chases after Yaakov, catches up to him because Yaakov's traveling with his whole family. But eventually they, they kind of reach uh, an agreement and they decide to make a, a breach, a covenant. By the way, I would just point out that isn't it strange, because the text in Hebrew is Vayivrachu v'chol asherlo, which literally means, what did Yaakov do? He escaped. He ran away. Yeah. Right? Like, why does he have to run away? I mean, if I'm working for you and I decide I want to stop working for you, I just say, Ari, I got other things to do. It's been nice. And in your two-week notice, and walk off. Yeah. my two-week <laughs> notice and walk off, right? But no. Instead, for some reason, Yaakov, he needs to run away. Strange kind of thing. And then Rav, Lavan runs after him as if he has some right to like recapture him or something. And then, lo and behold, once Lavan catches up to him, Lavan starts talking strangely and says, why did you steal my heart? And you treated my daughters like they were shvuyot cherev, like they were captives of the sword, right? Why did you sneak and run away like that? You didn't have to do that. You should have told me I would have sent you out with happiness. All I wanted to do was kiss my daughters. So it's almost like the reader is not sure what to make of this. Right. Was Yaakov wrong in running away? Really, Lavan just wanted to kiss his daughters, right? There's an ambivalence here. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Lavan is being duplicitous and Yaakov tried to leave before and Lavan's been tricking him this whole time and you understand from Yaakov's perspective why he felt like this was the only way out. Yes, and Lavan has always been duplicitous with Yaakov going back to the very beginning. It's interesting because that word, you treated my daughters like captives in Hebrew, kishvuyot cherev, like the captives of the sword. But interestingly, that word shvuyot, the shoresh, the root of it is shave. Interestingly, that was the actual word that Lavan duplicitously used to actually ensnare Jacob in a slavery-like situation in the first place, right? And it also, that word had to do with the daughters. Now, Lavan is twisting the word now. Shvuyat Cherev means captives. That's not quite the way Lavan used the word shave. He used it in a different kind of way. How did Lavan originally use the word shave? So let's go back to that story. And that story brings us to the moment when Yaakov first sets eyes on Rachel and asks Lavan for her hand in marriage. Genesis 29, 18, Yaakov at Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I'll work seven years for you, for Rachel, your younger daughter. Now, Ari, if you were Lavan, right, and I'm Yaakov, and I made you this offer, I'll work seven years for Rachel, your daughter, do we have a deal? So seemingly there's only two answers, and those are... <laughs> yes and no. But Lavan finds a third answer. Leave it to Lavan. Leave it to Lavan. I think that's a great title for this episode. <laughs> episode. Leave it to Lavan. Lavan finds the third option, which is neither yes nor no. Lavan is the king of intentional ambiguity. And so here's what he says. Well, I guess it's better to give her to you than to give her to someone else. Shva imadi. Uh, stay with me. But there's now, that language. Think about that. First of all, there's <laughs> yeah. that language, shva, Sorry. which later on comes to mean captives. Right. And the duplicitousness of the language is almost like this is Lavan's way of capturing Yaakov, but literally just means sit with me, like stay with me for a while. Now, what's that about? Was that deal or was that no deal? Well, I guess it's better to give it to you than to give it to someone else. So you're giving her to me? Like, right. <laughs> you, you never said yes. 
And also, what about the time period? I said seven years. What did you say? Shvai Madi. Right. <laughs> was that yes yeah. to the seven years? Right. Or just like, well, why don't you stay with me? Right. If Yaakov had a good lawyer with him, he would have made Lavan <laughs> right out. I agreed to have Yaakov serve me for seven years, and then I'll give him my daughter. That's right. So now the question is, what was going on in Lavan's head? At this time, you could see how Lavan might have sort of intentionally not said either yes or no, entertaining an entirely different fantasy of what's going on. I never agreed to give you my daughter for seven years of service. I said, you want my daughter? I could see giving you my daughter, maybe. Better giving her to you than someone. Why don't you come sit with me for a while? You know, Ari, every evil, every craziness has a backstory. And Lavan's craziness has a backstory, too. He has a way of actually seeing things. His way of seeing things is that I never treated Yaakov like a worker who had a deal, and I made a deal with him. I treated Yaakov as a slave, right? He came penniless. I brought him into my house, and I made the bargain that every master makes with a slave, which is I'll give you the security of a roof over your head. I'll give you the security of food to eat. And in return, you give me service without an end date. Now, I might might be my interest to keep you happy, so I'll lend you my daughters. You can hang out with them, even build a family with them. But are they yours? No, you're hanging out with my daughters. You're building a family that ultimately is my family. And this is the backstory that Lavan has in his mind when it's like, Shvaimadi, stay for a while. Now, later on, he'll complain. What'd you do treating my daughters? Shav, he'll use that word again, Kishvuya and Cherev, as if you've captured them. But the truth is, Yaakov is the one who's captured yeah. by Lavan himself in, in this story. Now, what happens is that later on, all of this comes to a head. When Yaakov leaves, Yaakov feels the need to run away, almost giving in to Lavan's view of him, yeah, right? Because that's not Yaakov's view. Yaakov's view is, I, I wasn't a servant. I was giving you work for hire, and I married these girls uh, as, as my just compensation. But then he runs away, sort of giving into Lavan's paradigm. Lavan runs after him, says, well, it was just my daughters. I love them so much, you know, and, and how come you ran away? In chapter 31, verse 43, Habanot banotai, the daughters are mine. Habanim banai, the grandchildren are mine. Hatson tani, all of the sheep are mine. Everything of yours is mine. He's like the villain, you know, who says, it's mine, it's mine. But in his world, Yaakov was a slave, and therefore everything is just really part of, of greater love and conglomerates. At this point, though, he says, but let's make a deal. And what is that deal? He says, I don't want you to mistreat my daughters. You can't take any other wives beside them. And at the very end of this, he says, there's unresolved differences, Lavan says, between me and you. So let the God of your fathers, Abraham, and let the God of my fathers, Nachar, who ultimately is the same God, let that God judge which one of us is right. And, you know, I always kind of wondered, did that ever happen? Right. Was there ever a moment where God comes out of the clouds and does what Lavan asks him to do, which is judge between Yaakov and Lavan, right? That's the question. Um, And in fact, I think he does. Bringing us to the introduction to these laws, these are the laws that you should put before him. Just to spell out what Rabbi Foreman is pointing to here. The word mishpatim means laws, but we could also translate it as judgments. It's from the same root as that word Lavan used, ishbatu, may God judge between me and you. I think there's a whole midrashic layer to this thing. We talked before about the simple layer of the text. It's almost like this is the midrashic layer of the text, where at some level there is a version of stories becoming our laws here, that the story of Lavan Yaakov and whether Yaakov did right by Lavan or not was left unresolved. God was called in to be a judge, and everything that happens now can be seen as a kind of judgment that God is making on that story. So let's kind of watch how that evolves. Judgment number one, ki tikna eved ivri. When you buy for yourself an eved ivri, a Hebrew servant, sheish shanim yavod, he should work for six years, but in the seventh year, he should go free. So uh, Ari, where's that coming off 
in our narrative, who is the Eved Ivri and who, so to speak, buys him. Yeah, I mean, so Yaakov is the Eved Ivri. It is Lavan who appears to buy him and she turns into a, basically a slave. That's right. And how long does he end up working for? Does right. he go free after seven years? So that's the big difference between these laws and Lavan, which is after the seventh year, Yaakov is still working. and That's right. And, and he gets captured, essentially, as this servant. So law number one is there's no such thing as doing that. If you've got yourself an Ivory, Ivory even if it's clear that he's an Ivory, Ivory, a servant, he, there's no such thing as working for seven years, then not really going free, and then continuing and never having any rest. No, term of servitude is always six years, and then seventh year you go free. The next law has to do with a wife, a wife that you would marry during a term of service. And of course, who does that remind us of in our Yaakov and Lavan story? who he marries while he's... Yima donav yitem lo isha, if a master would give a wife to him during his term of service, tragically, if he in fact is a servant, then it's true. The wife and, and children are left behind because they really belong to the master. And this is Lavan's view of it. It's not Yaakov's view of it. And unfortunately, as I think you said before, Yaakov didn't have a good lawyer with him <laughs> when uh, he negotiated this because there was that very ambiguous shva imadi from Lavan, in which Lavan says neither yes nor no to the proposal that will work for seven years for Rachel. Instead, there's just, well, you know, stay with me for a while, allowing Lavan to have one story and Yaakov to have another story. Yaakov's story is, hey, I was a regular worker. This is the re- repayment for my work. I get this wife, but, you know, I'm not your servant. Whereas Lavan is like, look, you're a penniless guy. You made this proposal. I never accepted it. I just said, stay with me for a while. Indefinitely, you're my servant. So God almost seems to not be taking a position on that. Right. But saying... That, well, if you are an Eved Ivry, Lavan would be wrong, even if you were an Eved Ivry, there's no such thing as working for more than six years. Right. But Lavan would be right if you were an Eved Ivry when it comes to the issue of who the wife and children belong to. Right. But, um, I mean, what we said before, it, on the one hand, there is no working for more than six years of Eved Ivry, but there is one exception, which is... If you love your wife and children and master, and you don't want to leave them. And that brings us to the next set of laws. So the next set of laws is, What if the servant says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go free. Now, when you read this, it strikes you as bizarre, because you can understand a slave saying, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go free. But what does the master have to do with this? But strangely, Ari, it's not just in the text here in Exodus that the reader finds it strange that for some reason the servant is attracted not just to his wife, but to the master, and for that wants to say. In the Yaakov story in Genesis, we have the same weird thing. Right? And it happens when Yaakov first lays Ida on Rachel, arguably one of the most romantic moments in the entire Torah. <laughs> right? Here he sees Rachel. She dazzles him, the girl of his dreams. Love it for this, a sight. Love it for a sight. There's this huge boulder that nobody can undo. He rolls off the boulder. He's Mr. Superman. She falls in love with him. What better moment than for him to ride off into the sunset and elope? But instead... It's all about the father-in-law. Right. Right? And how is that so? So let's go back to that text over there. Yeah, so um, we're in um, Genesis chapter 29, starting verse 10. So when Yaakov saw Rachel, the daughter of Lavan, the brother of his mother, and also the sheep of Lavan, the brother of his mother. That's a lot of Lavan, the brother of his mother. <laughs> right. There. It's all about love, and it's, not, it's almost like he loves Rachel partially because of who she is with respect to her father. Lavan is this relative, and he's so dying for a relative after being away from his mother that it's just like anything that it has to do with Lavan, I'll take. And he sort of falls in love, not just with this girl, but with this father-in-law who's going to indenture him, and that's part of what inspires him to just roll that rock off of the well, right? So what happens is that tragically, Yaakov's loneliness, his pining for anything that reminds him of home, Rachel, the daughter of Lavan, the brother of his mother, that pining for home ends up indenturing Yaakov. 
unbeknownst to him, because here he looks like who could be more free than this really, um, you know, muscular Superman who rolls the rock off the well. But at the very moment, Lovan comes out, and Lovan's like, let's go talk this over in the house. And he, he brings him home to the house, and that's when Lovin says these fateful words. So, what can I give you for all your work? And it's like seven years for Rachel Bitchak Tana, and that's when Lovin says neither yes nor no, but eh, stick around a while. Shva imadi. And that becomes the beginning of what ends up being a kind of eternal servitude, at least in Lovin's view. Which becomes, I think, the antecedent for these laws. If the servant says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to go free, I want to just serve forever, which really was Yaakov's lot as he falls in love with Lavan. And, and that her. love, by the way, it's all the same. It's like that, it's the same type of love that he has for his master and his wife, which is a crazy thing to think about. But that was for Yaakov. He, he loved them all as like his mother's family. Strange, by the way, that Lavan, when he says, you know, you should work for me for a while, says, ah, atzmiyu basari ata, you know, you are my own flesh and blood. Uh, you are my own essence and blood. But that word, atzmiyu basari, Ari, we were talking about that. What does that remind you of earlier in It reminds Genesis? you of how when Adam meets Chava for the first time. At the what? very first marriage in the Torah, he says, you're my flesh, you're my blood. That's right. And so Lavan is using those words to talk about Yaakov. Uh, sounds pretty weird, like <laughs> as if you know, like there's right. this romance between Lavan and Yaakov, and at some level there is. This is a hafti yet I have loved the, this person who's going to be my master. And by the way, this next word, which appears in Exodus, is very significant. Viki show Adonav Elohim, viki show Eladelat. So what do you do in that situation? The master takes him to the judges. The master takes him to the doorpost and pierces his ear. Well, it turns out that right, it pierces his ear and causes blood to flow, that it turns out that that word, vihigi show, vihigi show, appears back at the same scene in Genesis. In Genesis, what happens? Vayagesh Yaakov, Yaakov goes, and thinking about Lavan, how much he loves Lavan, and thinking about Rachel, he goes to this rock, and he uses his strength, much as the master is going to use the strength to pierce his ear, he uses his strength to take this rock off the well, allowing water to burst forth. The master's going to use his strength in Exodus to hammer the ear of the servant, allowing blood to burst forth. And where does it all happen? At the doorpost of the master's home. Exactly where Lavan absconds with Yaakov, taking him away from the scene of Vayagesh Yaakov when Yaakov comes to the well and taking him to his own territory, to the house where Yaakov is going to be indentured. And that's the last free moment that Yaakov has. From then on, he's deceptively brought into this world of servitude. Right. And it's all with that word, Vayigash Yaakov. It's almost like he walks into it himself. He walks into that into that trap. And so what the Torah is doing is taking this trap tragic story in which Yaakov is exploited, really, into becoming a servant and is saying, okay, here are the non-exploitation roles for a servant, right? Here, here are the rules, just so you know. And so you can't exploit a servant by making him work forever. Now there's a six-year term. You can't pull a lovin' on him and make him do seven years and then seven years, seven years. But the servant should walk in with eyes wide open it's a dangerous thing to get married during your term of service, right. right? Because you can end up sticking around in a way which you don't want to. And that be it also emerges out of the love, on, the love on story. So again, it's as if the Torah is not really taking a position on whether Yaakov was an avid ivory, as Lavan thinks he was, or whether Yaakov was a hired hand who was just to be paid for his labor, as Yaakov thinks he was. But it's saying that if there is this thing called servitude, it still only lasts for six years, and the servant should be forewarned about the risks of marrying during her term of servitude. That's a way of creating an eternal bond of servitude, almost something that Lovin knew. I yeah. wonder if part of what the Torah is suggesting is that what maybe have been part of Lovin's mindset, why was Lovin only too happy to give his daughter to Yaakov? What better way to keep your servant uh, hanging around and never running away right. than have him married to your kid. Right. Can you imagine how incensed Lovin must have been then when Yaakov ran away with the girl? Right. <laughs> the like, whole point was she was supposed to keep you around. Right. I mean, it's like if you chain a dog to the tree and 
all of a sudden you come there and you you see the dog running around with a branch still chained to it. That's right. <laughs> like the very thing that was supposed to keep him there, he took that with him. Exactly. Anyways, speaking of the girls, you know, the, the daughters are an important part of this picture. Right now we were talking about this from the perspective of Lavan, from the perspective of Yaakov, but what I want to suggest is that in the next verse in Exodus, verse 7, when a man will sell his daughter as a maidservant, the Torah switches and gives us the perspective of the daughters. Well, let's go back to the story that all these laws are based out of. So who's a man who sells his daughter as a maidservant in this Genesis story? It's got to be Lavan, because he says, right. you know, the payment for your work for seven years is going to be you, Rachel. So Rachel, in a way, gets sold. But it's strange because the Midrashic take on that is almost as if she's being sold as a servant herself. In other words, it's not that she's yeah. been given her hand in marriage. It's that she goes from being a free person into an indentured servant because if you're sold to a servant, who must you be? A servant. Another servant. And so Rachel intuits that she's been exploited. She's marrying someone who my father has dominated and turned into a servant. When a man sells his daughter as a maidservant, she doesn't go out the way he would go out. She goes out through marriage, but then we get this sort of interesting, almost sarcastic take on what Lavan did to her. Now, before, Ari, we had talked about the simple meaning of those words. I'm not even going to repeat it now because the Midrashic right. reading is so at variance <laughs> with the simple meaning that it would almost confuse you. So just listen to this new meaning. She's so bad, so disgusting, in the eyes of her master. Well, who would Rachel's master be? Her husband is going to be Yaakov, but who's her master? Yeah, it, it would be her father. If she's Lavan. a servant, like he's a servant, then he, she, like Yaakov, are both indentured to a master. So Lavan occupies a dual role for her. Right. Not just father, but also master. She's so disgusting, so evil, so reprehensible in the eyes of her master, Lavan, Asher Loya Ada, that he didn't even bother designating her. The hefta and the hefta can mean to redeem or to switch out. Well, who was not designated in marriage and then switched out? Yeah, it was Rachel. That's and, Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think how bad it must feel to be Rachel. Right. My father was so disgusted in me, that he wasn't even just a father, he was like a master. Yeah. And the master exploited me for money and didn't even bother designating me to a particular person, just left it ambiguous. Oh, yeah, good idea. Maybe you, Ra- Yaakov and, and Rachel, and then sort of left hanging for a while. Yeah. Right, Shva hang around a while. We'll see what happens. Vefta, the last moment I got switched out for Leah, what greater betrayal is there than that, right? Leading to how Rachel and Leah will both see this at the end. Because when Yaakov comes to them and says, it's time to leave, they're like, yeah, because dad was never a dad to us. He exploited us. Kanachrios nechshav. He treated us like stranger. He sold us. He didn't even give us the money. Right. All the profits that he made went to him. That same language becomes the master can't exploit these girls, right? He certainly can't sell her to anyone else. And then finally, if the master or the master's son ends up marrying the girls, he has to treat them with true equality, such that, and now we hear words again borrowed from Lavan. If the, if the master's son should decide to take yet another wife beside this maidservant, he can't have his high-class wife and his low-class wife. No, the maidservant who comes from poverty, he can't lessen any privileges from her. All that language comes from Lavan, Lavan's hypocrisy. At the very <laughs> end of the story, this is what Lavan's going to say. You have to promise me you'll never take another wife in addition to my two daughters and never oppress them. Well, who's the greatest oppressor of his daughters? That's Lavan himself, who, who made Yaakov do exactly that. He forced Yaakov into the situation of having to have two wives. Who, having one wife right, and then taking, taking another, another one, Rabano, yeah. which is literally the sisters themselves. So what the Torah is doing is sort of taking this train wreck of a story, which is Lavan and Yaakov, Lavan's utter exploitation of his daughter and building something redemptive. The history was there was a father who was so exploitative of his daughters that he himself became their master and ended up selling them for money and not treating them as daughters and switching them out and doing all these terrible things, right? So out of that, we make a new law. 
which is, instead of rich man Lavan exploiting his daughters for yet even more money, the law is that there's a poor man who wants to give his daughters a second chance and actually marry into society. Instead of marriage being how Lavan sees it, I will use marriage as a tool to get my slave to stay here for longer, to get him to give me his service for all of her work. Instead, marriage becomes the end and not the means, right? So what do I do? I can sell her as a maidservant, but she's going to end up being married and swept away off into the castle by some prince who's going to get a chance to see her and decide to take her in. And there's an expectation that the master, who is separate from the father, a separate master, has this protective feeling towards this girl, an understanding that he would marry her. And if he doesn't, then the father has to have the chance to redeem her. Instead of the father switching her out, and right. destroying her wedding day. It's like if the wedding day doesn't take place because the other man didn't do right by her, then the father, who's the good guy, can sweep back in and redeem her and say, and come back, back to my house. It's all the, and protect her. It's the, it's the, have to become yeah. the ultimate of father protectiveness instead of the father exploitiveness of, of, of love on. Yeah. And instead of like forcing the wrong daughter on someone like he does, right? That's right. And instead, I'll take you back and we'll find the right husband for you. So literally all of these laws are an attempt to redeem the evil of Lavan, a man whose name suggests whiteness and purity. Everything he does is only pure in his own eyes, but he's blind to the exploitation, which the Torah just calls out as evil. She's so evil, so disgusting, right? Naming the the, the sort of uh, pain that Lavan inflicts upon Rachel without even being able to see it. And it's like, I just wanted to kiss my daughters goodbye. They're so wonderful when they don't want to have anything to do with this man who's really ruined their lives. So I think it's a beautiful example of how you know, stories become our laws. It's not always that a story is emulated when it comes to laws. Right. Here, the story becomes a model of what not to do, and the laws have to pick up on that and change it. Kind of goes into the story with a scalpel and says, like, right. this is what he could have done, but and this is what he actually did. And here's where it really yeah. went off the rails. And, and you know, what, what this makes me think of is one of the things psychologists talk about is how, like, we all want to be the hero of our own story. And none of us want to see ourselves as the bad guy. And we weave these brilliantly creative tales um, in order to justify our own actions. And I think what Parshmi Shbatim seems to be doing so brilliantly here is giving us this incredibly precise commentary on the Yaakov Lavan story and saying, here's what Yaakov thought was happening and like, here's what Lavan thought was happening. And here is how he saw himself as doing a moral, uh, maybe even um, altruistic thing. Um, but here's exactly where he went wrong. Yep, beautiful Ari. Thank you so much. Always great to hang out with you. And thank you for inviting me into your <laughs> palace. Speaking of the house, right? Well, if you want to marry my daughter, you can stay long. <laughs> I got a while to wait to marry your daughter. Catch Thank you, this is cool. As a reminder, Into the Verse is taking a break for a little while. In the interim, you can stay up to date on the Parsha with last year's episodes, which are available on olivebeta.org. And if you haven't started the latest season of A Book Like No Other, I highly recommend it. You can find that on our website too. Thank you so much for listening.